From now through December 8th, Tandem Press is featuring an exhibit by their own employees, and it's called Nights and Weekends because obviously this is what these people do on nights and weekends when they're not working. And Nights and Weekends features a selection of artwork created by these staff members who are Bruce Crownover, Seth Clay Camp, Mishka Lewis, Rachel Griffin, Jason Rule, and Sona Pastel Danishkar. Although their conceptual interests and aesthetic styles are individually distinct, these artists are tied together, not only through their shared employment at Tandem Press, but also through a common tendency to closely study their subject matter and sharply consider subtleties of perception. Let's talk to these artists. I'm talking with Rachel Griffin, who is the financial manager for Tandem Press, which which I only find a little intimidating. Um, but uh, so she handles all the purse strings. But she's also an artist, and pretty much everybody who works here is an artist, which I find just to be a beautiful thing because. You know, you work for a place that does art because this is where your passion is. So, first of all, thank you for doing, for talking with us yeah, about this. Of course, thank you yeah. for everything. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, now, first question I have to ask you is: Are there any desserts of which you are particularly fond? Um, looking at these, I see, I see a theme. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I prefer ice cream, but I'm more of a seasonal kind of dessert person. So okay. the summer ice cream, of course, and like holiday stuff. Okay. I get into holiday stuff. I'm seasonal in that sense too. Okay. Um, and you like pie. It's okay. Actually, That's I fine. don't really enjoy pie as much. I'm more of a cake person, oh. but pie is kind of, it's a little more, it's there's a lot more going on. It's more fun to make an image of. I keep finding new ways to portray the pie. Okay. <laughs> portray the cherries in different ways, and I would keep going with it. Although this is a cherry pie, and that is not a cherry pie. I should okay. Clarify. Okay. clarify. So, so first of all, tell me about the, the process. What, how was this created? These are both monotypes. So with monotype, what I do is I ink up a piece of plexiglass and I have kind of a template or map of this image underneath. Um, and then I roll up ink and then I wipe away the ink wherever I don't want it to print. So it's kind of a subtractive process. And then I have that first layer of one color that I want to start with. And then I print that on a piece of paper, run it through the press. And then I start all over again with a different color. So it's building up layers of colors, kind of like a painting. And with monotype, there's only one. So with many printmaking processes, you're additioning it, you have a set of 20 or however many you decide to do, but with monotype, you only get one. And you can also get a ghost print, so you print it once and then there's still some residual ink on the plexiglass that you can print it again and it's just like a more anemic version of that first print. Okay. So sometimes I do that if I think it'll work nice in a lighter version and I can do whatever I want with that, but not always. If I can tell it's not gonna be a good ghost print, then I don't bother. Is there a reason for doing it as a monotype as opposed to making more copies um, in, terms of, in terms of how it's going to turn out? Or is that a decision you made just because you want one and only one? Sometimes if I do want more than one, I will make a point to addition it in a different way. Um, if I think it's something that people might want, I'll make more than one, if I can kind of tell. But... Um, or if I think I might want to show it in different places or um, sell them, then I'll make more than one. But it's that's usually not the main um, point when I decide because I do love the monotype process. It's very painterly. It's um, more gestural. You can get your hand in there and wipe away the ink, and you don't have to set it into a copper plate or cut it into wood in a specific way. So you get a different look, and you can be much softer. Like These look very much like paintings because I can be so soft with the way I'm removing the ink with just a little bit of the ink on there and the interaction between the layers is more spontaneous. So I really love the process. It surprises me too because you only have that one go. Yeah. So right. it's, it's very direct and um, I'm just able to respond to the layers as I print them, which is really enjoyable and I get some surprises. So it, I like to control things a lot Probably as a financial manager, that makes sense. That totally makes sense, yeah. <laughs> um, with this, it kind of makes me let go of some of that planning and expectation, which I enjoy the surprises that can sometimes happen. Okay. Yeah. 
That is terrific. I, I wish we had more time to explain this, but just in a few seconds, can you just tell me what, when people come in to look at this, what, uh, what, what, what should they be looking for in these, in these pieces? What, what, what would you want the viewer to, to come away with? I'm a big advocate of letting people see whatever they would like to see, but something that I enjoy and I've noticed other people like to look at is kind of the um, sometimes wrinkles that you can see in the food that I've been doing um, and the layers and kind of veins yeah. that are kind of right. in the image right. too. Um, just the details. Yeah. Yeah, and the richness of the color. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great work, and uh, and here you go, artist, financial manager. Um, you just you just bring it all, Rachel. Thanks so much. Thanks, bud. All right. Tandem Press curator Mishka Lewis is also someone we've gotten to know well because we take over all of their offices when we do the mixing for the uh, jazz series. And um, and again, you know, not only a, a, a wonderful human being, but you, now you're an artist as well as curator for Tandem Press. And, uh, and you have two sets of three pieces in this, both of which are on a theme. And... Uh, uh, bricks and are these manhole covers? Yeah, they are. They're based off of manhole covers. I call them access covers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the bricks. What uh, what are the what are the materials and what, what's your what's your inspiration? You obviously like sort of uh, you know constructiony like uh, industrial kind of things. Yeah, I mean, so the bricks are a series that I've been working on for a couple of years now, and it really started as um, a study in seeing how many individual expressions of a brick I could create. I'm interested in these units that make up our environment, um, specifically, like you said, the industrial, our external environment. Um, and these are three pieces that are newer. I finished them within the last couple of months. Um, so when I started this series, I was making flat images of bricks, but they've further turned into three-dimensional objects. Um, so this one here is cross-stitch embroidered. So each little dot of color you're seeing is two stitches of thread that cross over each other like an X. Okay. And um, it may not be noticeable in the video, but the areas where there's holes, the, the X's get smaller, so there's higher detail in those sections where, I mean, if you can think about it as kind of like pixels. They're larger pixels that okay. make up the rest of the brick. Um, so I start with an, a photograph and then digitally manipulate that and from that create a pattern that I follow as I stitch these by hand. So they, they kind of look like if you take a globe and flatten it into a map, whereas so it's kind of this funny form mm -hmm. until I then wrap it around the wood panel to create the actual object of it. Okay, I love your your imagery of pixels because now I'm I'm already seeing it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Right. Um, so it's a very time intensive, painstaking process, uh, and then these two are screen print on fabric, which is then wrapped around um, a wood panel. Um, the embroidery is also wrapped around a wood panel. Um, in that case, it's fully solid and flat. Uh, so. The image is really dealing with the perspective of this image of brick, which is forced into an object shape. Uh, for these two, um, you may notice in the image, these holes uh, in this brick is carved in about half an inch on either side. Right, right. These, these two look three-dimensional, but this one actually is. Right, and this one is as well. There's actually holes that go through the entire brick. Oh, there are, okay. Um, yeah, so if, if you stand actually opposite of where we are, you get the actual, um, a more correct perspective, like the image makes more sense, and then as soon as you move, you realize that the image doesn't stay with the object's form. Okay. So there's, you know, I'm kind of grappling with what it means to, to create an image and push it into an object form and just what happens when the image and object don't play together okay. totally. Um, it's just a fascinating process for me. Um, All right, now let's, let's move on to the, to the access covers, as you call them. And uh, so the, these, are, these are just gorgeous. And, um, and I, 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 I don't uh, 
touch them because I know I'm not supposed to, but that's my first, but I so want to touch them. They're, they are so, um, they are just tactily flirting with me, I, I feel like, but, uh, but uh, tell us about this process. I, that's great to hear that because that's what I'm going for. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's, it's dealing with a similar idea of taking an image and pushing it into an object form. So I start with a photograph of uh, manhole covers. These are images I take myself or source from the internet. Um, after digitally manipulating it in Photoshop, I have a company print them on velvet for me. And so the velvet is really giving that kind of shiny iridescence and like seductive surface. Um, and then it's a long process of cutting out um, each of these little shapes to create essentially a map. And then from that, I uh, carve a wood panel to create the form of the manhole cover and then the velvet pieces are then adhered back to the surface and then of course that leaves all of these edges that are carved away yes. would then be raw wood and so then I coat those with flocking which is essentially little tiny fibers of fabric that you know I paint with an adhesive and then the fibers stick to them. But yeah, I mean, I, so you may notice that manhole covers typically have words or numbers or you know, some sign of signifying marks on them, which I've removed from the images. So I want them to remain a little bit more universal. And you know, when they're displayed in a wall instead of on the ground, in this manner, they kind of operate more so of like mandalas or you know, these meditative patterns that kind of suck you in. Um, yeah, so I really just wanted to, to celebrate these aspects of our environment, like the bricks. These are things that we are around all the time and may not notice or pay attention to. Um, or see artistic value in. Yeah, yeah, or, or see the, the individual nature because these are mass-produced items and you know, by making them very painstakingly and laboriously by hand, it gives it a different sense of, of value. Um, so that's one reason why I chose to use velvet for these, because velvet is a more luxurious, you know, fabric. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Mishka. I, w I wish we had more time, but these are really lovely pieces and a great way to look at, you know, like you said, sort of industrial, um, you know, construction-y things that we normally wouldn't see uh, artistic type of qualities in, and you have, uh, you've really successfully brought that out. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Another of our friends at Tandem Press and another one of the curators here is Sona Pastel Danishgar, and, uh, and her piece is much smaller than some of the other pieces in this, uh, in this display and, uh, and, uh, and a little more delicate, but um, just, just gorgeous stuff. And this is called Untitled, uh, in parentheses, Memory of a Thought. So, so tell us about the, the title and the concept here. So this is a handmade artist book that I, I made. Um, I've been working with the subject of memory for a long time and sort of documenting that. Um, and so I thought it would be a, a, a nice thing to do with uh, this book here. Uh, so it's, uh, the images are actually transparencies, so they, um, you can see through each page, and so you'll see um, layer upon layer if you look at it um, from a certain angle, and so it kind of references, you know, memories that get stacked up over time, and um, so that's, that's the idea behind it. Now, now, when you say transparencies, I think about when um, when my my dad used to do photography. He would he would take mostly slides rather than photographs, and I believe that that's that was a transparency. And then you would put that in a projector, and you could put it on the screen. Is that what you mean? Is that or is that a different use of the term? Um, a slightly different, but the same idea. They are positive images, um, but they've been printed digitally rather than uh, uh, processing slide film. So. so, so this is photography, and then what? What do you do after that? In other words, uh, some of the pieces here have started, you know, as 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 one thing, and then and then another process is is laid over them. Um, what do you do after the photograph is taken? So after the photograph is taken, and I've printed it out for this uh, project in particular, then I actually made the entire book from scratch. So um, it's 
measuring and cutting out <laughs> all the pages that are um, the images are going to slide into. Um, like I said, they're 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 windows, so you can see through them. Um, so it was a lot of measuring and cutting, um, trying to be as exact as possible to do that, so they all line up correctly. Um, and then also, you know, binding the the covers as well, and then assembling the whole book together. Measure twice, cut once, right? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> When people come in here to look at this, this is the most, uh, this is the smallest and most, you know, I would say sort of, um, I don't know if I want to say delicate, but it's, it's, it's sort of the, the, the thing that people are going to have to look at most closely, I think, out of all these displays just because of the size. Is there, is there advice that you would give the viewer when he or she comes in as a way to get the most, a way to view it to get the most out of it, or is it just... Soak it in and get what you get. Um, no, I, 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 if they're on a pedestal, I'd like to invite people to sort of move around it so they can see it from different angles. Um, the way the lighting is as well, um, it's also, you know, there are reflections of the images on the, the pedestal as well. So it really, it, a book in general does invite you sort of to inspect it a little closer. Um, and that's, that is definitely, you know, an element of this project that I, I want people to do as well. So. And this is probably a really dumb question, but luckily I'm, I'm not afraid of, of asking those. Is there any value um, in looking from, from behind through the other way? Is there, is there an image there as well? Yeah, I would say yes, you know, that um, looking at it from all angles is, is a good way to encounter it. So. Great. Sona, thank you so much. This is, this is a really beautiful piece. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Good to talk to you. you too. Master printer and shop manager Jason Rule is another artist here at Tandem Press. And uh, Jason, the, the, I want to know a little bit about the processes here, but I'm going to start with just the titles. You have pieces on this side and this side that the names are just numbers. And then in the middle, you have, you have these two pieces, one of which, um, Last Night I Dreamt That Somebody Loved Me, which I believe is a Smith song, correct? Yeah, it is a Smith song, but this uh, piece is based on the low cover of okay. the Smith song. Okay. The um, low, the band from Duluth, yeah. Minnesota, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, so these two works are a part of a series that um, I send people that I know a letter requesting a list of five songs, and then I tell them that I'll make something influenced by one of those songs, and then I send them the piece. So that's the titles come from the song that the image is based on. And where, how are these images created? Uh, so they're collage images, but they're all built in Photoshop. So like the image on the bottom, uh, the head of the gentleman is from one source, the body's from a source, the record player's from a source. So I basically find all those things and Photoshop, out, Photoshop them all together. Well, and, and this, uh, tell me about this, this image. This, uh, this kid looks like he, he's, uh, he's either, he's, his head has been injured perhaps, and, uh, and he looks very freaked out. Yeah, uh, that one is the song Some Strange Reaction by Firewater. And so it's the same kind of thing. Like sometimes it's lyrically based. Like there's just something that goes over and over, and it just makes me kind of start to build an image that way. Like I kind of just look through all the stacks and stacks of books that I have, and sometimes it's the pace of the song, sometimes it's the color of the song, like it kind of starts the beginning of the image, and then I just kind of take it from there. So it's just that song made me start, like I started with the kid, but then I added the eyes, I added the mouth, I added the bow tie, I added the head wrap, like to him, just because of the nature of that song. Okay, yeah, it looks, uh, it looks like a really cool, like, an, uh, like 1950s, uh, you know, uh, comic book image. Yeah, yeah it's from, uh, from some comic about a kid that is, like, into cowboys and wants to go to a dude ranch or something like that. I can't remember the name of it. Don't we all? Uh, <laughs> and then these pieces, and, and I, I want to know about this. We've seen this one actually lit up, but these pieces are titled with numbers. We have, this is 83018 number two, and this is 92018 number five. So tell us about the, and similar titles here, tell us about the, the pieces and, uh, and what the numbers mean. So again, this is collage based. Um, and so it started out as a thing that a friend of mine sent me a big box of QSL cards, which are cards that ham radio operators used to use to send each other a note saying like, I received your signal on this date, blah, 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 blah. And so I didn't know what I was gonna do with them. And so at first it just started as like a really nice way to get in the studio and kind of do like calisthenics in a way, just like warm up 
to then go into the other stuff. Okay. Uh, and so now I just, when I started doing it, I just started to really enjoy just making abstract collage instead of kind of the figurative based stuff. So the dates actually refer to the date that the piece is started. And so if it's like number four, that means that there were four different ones started on that day and maybe one, two, and three are the beginnings of four or they're completely separate pieces. It kind of just depends. So a QSL card, did it have words or just image? I mean, what, 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 what is... It had a little bit of both. Like, it has text on it usually. Um, on the back, there's, like, a handwritten address and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of these, I stopped using that as source material and just going into all my other material that I get the other collage stuff from. But instead of looking for figurative elements, I decided, you know, I just went into like an area and just pull this like little section out of a flag or out of something and building, you know, building them in that sense because I kept the format of the card, which is four by six, but I just, it got to be pretty limiting in terms of what I could use for source material. That's really trivial because I feel like what, what a lot of you guys are doing is just getting, uh, taking things that normally would not be seen as having any artistic value and finding artistic value in them, like with, like with Mishka's uh, manhole covers or access covers as she, as she sees them. And, um, and you've done that with QSL cards and with these, uh, these images. Um, anything else you want to say about these pieces before we wrap? Uh, no, I mean, I, I guess the, the other thing about it is like, even though they may seem very different, I see them in a similar way and because I kind of feel like I'm making Frankenstein's monster in a way. Like I'm flying all these pieces and making a whole out of them. And that's kind of the part of the process that I really enjoy is like building something out of all these other things that weren't necessarily together. Great. And unlike Frankenstein's monster, these will not rise up and kill you later. Not that I know of. Not that you know of. Jason Rule, thank you so much. Seth Claycamp is a preparator, or the preparator, at Tandem Press. And before we even talk about the art, I've just got to, I, I've never even heard that word before. What does that mean? Uh, it's generally reserved for museums, but it's the person who takes care of the artwork, uh, does installation, packing, shipping, okay. creating, things like that. Pre preparatory stuff. Yes, exactly. Makes, makes total sense. <laughs> Okay. That makes sense. So let's talk about these pieces. They, they obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously anything because I'm not that knowledgeable about artwork, but it seems to me that these started out as photographs and then you did some kind of manipulation beyond that. Uh, yeah, I like to have a little bit of my own hand in the work rather than them just being photographs. So something to put a piece of myself in there. So whether it's like laying them or flipping them or... Like on that one behind you, uh, added watercolor to it. I was going to ask what the color, what the yep. coloration was. Yeah, it's uh, just watercolor, and then scanned in, and then uh, layered over top of it. And is it, is it d d depictive of something? Are we supposed to think of of raindrops or anything, or is it just, is it just an enhancement to the photograph that doesn't have a literal meaning? It has meaning. Uh, the bird in the upper right hand corner is moving out, so it's kind of like. Um, things coming up, moving away, escaping. Okay. Yeah. And this piece, this tree, uh, this tree is just it, gorgeous. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time just looking at it before I realized that it is not a picture of a tree divided between two frames. It is actually the same side of a tree mirror image flipped. Yes, it is, yeah. yeah. And what is the uh, what and what is the um, what is the message here as opposed to just having a picture of a tree? Uh, it's I spend a lot of time in nature, and um, if you spend enough time with anything, you start to see the depth in it. And uh, I like to take the same image and manipulate it and look at it in as many different ways as possible to get as much out of it as I can. And um, I find with photography, with the light and shadows, you can take a single image and turn it upside down or flip it sideways or move it in any direction and it takes on a whole new meaning and can give you a whole new perspective on the image. 
Yeah, it really is great. This is a piece that I could spend a lot of time uh, looking at. And then the third piece is uh, a bird flying over buildings. And I love the title. You have called this uh, Eternal Seeker. And uh, is that us or the bird or everything? Uh, I think it's us. Sorry, it's, sorry to move on you. <laughs> I think it's us. It's me. Uh, I think it's everyone. I think everybody's always looking for something, the next thing. Okay. That that makes perfect sense, and I also kind of see it as the bird. There's this bird uh, flying overhead. Um, you're looking around, and so uh, he or she may also be uh, an eternal seeker. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific pieces. Um, anything else you want to add before we before we wrap up? Ah, uh, no. This this has been very nice. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Seth. Beautiful work. Bruce Crownover has also got works in the Nights and Weekends exhibit, and he is a master printer with Tandem Press. Bruce, welcome. Thank you very much. And one of the things I really love is when arts and sciences meet up, and that's what you've done with your pieces. And, uh, and so I'd like to know, first of all, what, what is the, the theme? You're mm -hmm. dealing with, with sure. uh, a very important theme yes. in these works, and then we'll talk a little bit about the process. Sure, so the idea is, uh, was started by a friend of mine, Todd Anderson, who worked at Tandem many years ago, and now teaches at Clemson. He had this idea of let's travel and see some of these places that are being affected by climate change and do an artistic record of what's happening uh, in order to kind of share with the greater population something that isn't just strictly science-based. So we went first to Glacier National Park, backpacked to a lot of different places, and saw as many glaciers as we could and made little watercolor paintings in my case and then turned those into prints and turned the prints into a book. In the case of the show that's a, a tandem now, it's the same idea but about Rocky Mountain National Park. And looking at glaciers again and seeing the changes that are taking place as a result of climate change and making an artistic record of what's there now. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm taking some liberties with how I present them, but the contour of the glacier is very accurate as is the ridge line of the mountains and then some of the other stuff is you know using artistic license but um, you know the idea really is to capture these things before they're gone mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so should people look at your prints as accurate representations like a, like a photograph or are they or are they more like imaginings how how realistic yeah, are you Yeah somewhere in between I guess okay. it, technically um, I work mostly from paintings done on site and mm. I'm trying to pay really close attention to get the details of the glacier correct and in some cases they're a little bit complicated so I will refer back to photographs but I'm really trying to make it into my art. Mm. This is this is not really a, a photographic record of a place. It's trying to capture somewhat of the feeling of being there. The colors are heightened, and you know, uh, and then there's something about you know the the way I render the places are a little bit made up, perhaps. I mean, you know, I'm I'm making up rocks that maybe don't exist mm. in that exact spot, but. The details of as far as you know, what the ridge looks like, what the glacier looks like, are accurate. Okay. Yeah, but it's really an artistic lens. Great. And you mentioned earlier too when we were talking mm -hmm. uh, uh, privately that this it's a wood print mm -hmm. and it's a reductive process, right. which also you know as you pointed out is representative of the re reductive process we're going through right. with these with these glaciers. Tell us about the process because most sure. you know neither I nor most of the people watching this are print artists. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a pretty basic kind of idea, um, though it can get really elaborate and in my case it gets quite elaborate because I'm really getting a lot of color out of one block. So it starts with a little watercolor painting and then I blow that watercolor painting up to the scale that I want to do the finished woodcut in. And then I repaint the watercolor just in black and white gouache to that scale directly on the wood. So I've got basically a, I mean, just a, a graphic rendition of the image on the wood. And then I carve what I want to be the lightest parts of the image, which is typically in the snow somewhere or in the ice. Then I print, let's say, 25 sheets of paper. 
Uh, I'll print all 25 sheets in a very, very light color, pale blue or pale gray in the entire sheet. So what you start with is the white of the paper and the lightest color. Then I carve, go back to that same block, carve what I want to reserve as that first light color. Print all 25 sheets in a color that's slightly darker or different than the first color. Then I carve again, mix a new color that's slightly darker, print all 25 sheets again, and mm. you keep reducing the amount of information on the block. And so you're working from light to dark. So in the end, it's the same block, but you're only printing the very, very darkest lines. And everything else is gone. There's no going back. You have to make the decisions of the color choices as you go. There's um, not an undo button. <laughs> no, there's not an undo button. And you know, and when they're sold out, they're gone. Yeah. Um, so people sometimes say, if you want to, you know, can you make more? No, this is it. This is a one-time thing. And it just sort of lends itself to this idea that these things are disappearing. They're reducing in size. Yeah. And it's just, a, you know, kind of a, a poetic way to make prints. So how many times do the 25 sheets get run through? Uh, it depends on the image. But yeah. anywhere from, I'd say, 12 to 25. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A wonderful and... Um, you know, frankly, kind of sobering mm. um, view these these prints. Yeah. Um, so thank you for doing yeah, them. And uh, again, for the viewer, it's nights and weekends. It's these very talented people who have day jobs at Tandem Press, but then are artists in their own right. And uh, and you can see what these people are doing when they are not uh, working in art in their own way in tandem press they're doing their own art and uh and it's kind of like what we do in the studio what are you doing on your day off recording something uh so uh it's really terrific work yeah thanks very much yeah, yeah thank you Bruce. Yeah, yeah thanks all right